why don't we go ahead and begin and then Kevin can join us when he arrives. The last panel was focusing on the schools that have had to deal without affirmative action because of voter initiative and talking about what worked and what hasn't worked for them. And we want very much to continue that discussion, but also it seems important, and it's the focus of this panel, to talk about what's unresolved after the Supreme Court's decision in Students of Fair Admission versus Harvard College, and how should these unresolved issues be approached? We have a terrific panel to discuss this. Um, I'll introduce them. Kevin Johnson hasn't yet joined us, but he is the Dean and maybe analyst Professor of Public Interest Law, Chicano, Chicano Legal Studies at University of California Davis School of Law. He's been Dean there since 2008, member of the faculty since 1989. Also, we're joined by Timothy Lynch, who's the Vice President and General Counsel of the University of Michigan. He's been in that role since 2013. For that, he was at the Department of Energy and an Assistant United States Attorney. Um, I apologize that these were brief introductions, but I want as much time as possible for discussion. I'm sure everyone can tell we could not have a more eminently qualified group of people to talk about this. I think what I'd like to start with is by asking each of you, what do you see as the most important issues that the Supreme Court didn't resolve in students for admission versus Harvard College, as well as your perspectives on how colleges and universities, law schools in particular, should be approaching them and then I have a lot of specific questions I'd like to ask you, um, many of which are based on the questions that we've gotten earlier this morning that go to exactly this that we haven't yet discussed. So Tim, if I could start with you. Sure, and thank you everyone. Uh, if I could just give the caveat that of course I'm not providing legal advice on this, uh, particularly because I might get it wrong. But with that in mind, um, you know, I think the key questions that have not been decided yet and that frankly leave open some room for schools and colleges, what about financial aid? What about pipeline programs? What about relationships with alumni associations? Um, what about efforts to recruit students to increase yield? Um, and the larger question, which I'd say is uh, coming out of the Thomas Jefferson School case, um, how do we approach race conscious, but also race neutral um, means to achieve greater or at least protect diversity gains? Um, we don't know whether the Supreme Court will take cert, but that two to one and the, the arguments in the Fourth Circuit are really important for how we can move forward. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. So we've been joined by Kevin. Kevin, your thoughts about what's the issues that are most important that are left open? Well, I think that the biggest issues, and they've been mentioned really already, is what can be done after the decisions. Uh, and I think one of the things that really is important to do uh, is to be careful, uh, revisit admissions procedures, criteria, uh, and uh, I think carefully about how to proceed uh, in, in California, sadly enough, in, in my estimation, uh, we've had experience with this after uh, the voters passed Proposition 209 in 1996, and we've been living in a, a race-neutral regime in terms of admissions since then. Uh, we have uh, taken up, uh, actually before what the Supreme Court said, uh, individual uh, issues of disadvantage, disability, contributions to diversity, language skills, uh, and a variety of other criteria in the admissions process. We um, uh, in California, and I know UC Berkeley is a part of this, is, is, is all the UC law schools, part of a, a, a California law pathways program, um, and which is designed to uh, cater to and, and inform about law schools, uh, first generation students, uh, students from diverse backgrounds. Uh, and it starts in a community college and it continues to four year universities and then continues to law schools, public and, and private in the, in the state. Um, so, and I, I think um, um, one of the things that it's been really hard, uh, but it takes resources is uh, reaching out uh, 
to try to recruit uh, in as it, 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 it aggressive a form as possible to um, uh, communities that are underrepresented in legal education. Uh, and um, we, we, we have um, worked hard at that. All the schools in California have done that. But I, I think what the Supreme Court has left open is what you can do is told us pretty clearly what you can't do, um, uh, at least in some ways. And we have to think carefully about how to proceed. I, I do think, and actually I was somewhat ill at ease to even talk today, um, because uh, in California and in many states, um, you know, we, we um, have to make, obviously have to be careful to comply with the law, uh, but any public statements about admissions, any emails about admissions uh, often come under scrutiny and all the law schools, I think, are already feeling some scrutiny uh, with um, many of them, if not all of them, receiving a letter from Stephen Miller not long after the decision about um, um, uh, the, the court's decision and what it held. So I, I think it, you know it's going to require a lot of a lot of care, sensitivity, uh, obviously compliance with the law, um, but um, you know steps can be taken, and there's a lot left open by the Supreme Court. You've identified many areas that are left open. I'd like to go back and talk about them in some detail, less about predicting what the court's going to do, and more about your thoughts about how law schools should approach them in light of the uncertainty. Um, many of these questions that I'm going to pose came from the last two sessions that we weren't able to get to, but fit very much within this panel. And of course, everyone who's listening can continue to submit questions. Please do so through the Q&A function, not the chat function. One of the things that several of you just referred to is what about proxies that might yield diversity? Tim, you were talking about the Thomas Jefferson case out of the Fourth Circuit that may be going to the Supreme Court. Some of the questions that we got that were submitted earlier this morning, if a school has a motive of having a more racially diverse student body, but uses race neutral means like Texas's 6% plan, given the race conscious the motive would such a plan pass constitutional muster? Another person wrote, if a school uses a race neutral criterion as a proxy race, and the school knows its use is apt to make the school more racially diverse, must the school genuinely value diversity with respect to that criteria, e.g. zip code? If not, isn't that likely labeled as pretextual? You get the sense of the questions. Um, again, my question is less, what do you think the Supreme Court's going to do? And much more, how do you think law schools should go about thinking about this in light of the decision that came down 10 days ago? Tim, you started us with the Thomas Jefferson case. Maybe talk about it a bit more, but then also your thoughts of what schools should do. Sure. Thank you. So is there, if there's, uh, I'm not sure of the awareness of the Thomas Jefferson case. Thomas Jefferson is a high school in Northern Virginia that is a magnet program and is seen widely as one of the very top schools, uh, high schools in the country. Um, for years, it had an admissions program that really looked at not just uh, grades, but also specific test scores. And it produced a significant lack of diversity, um, depending on how you define it. Um, for years, this is they've the school tried to tinker on the margins. Um, in 2020, they made a decision to take race neutral means, um, but as a way to be race conscious about increasing diversity. So in some ways akin to the Texas model, they decided to move away from feeder schools by creating percentages for various middle schools in Northern Virginia. And as a result, they did increase diversity um, among African-American Hispanic students. Um, for Asian-American students, the numbers did decrease um, in some ways. Um, but so the question was, there was an effort here to increase diversity. It did have an impact on reducing the number of Asian-Americans, but the means were neutral. Um, and in one of the concurrence, the concurrence, which I think is helpful, says if doing this, if taking such race neutral means is now also prohibited, it's really a bait and switch. But in terms of what law schools should do right now, I mean, the, what, the hard thing for all of us is interpreting the last two pages of the chief's opinion. There's a giveth and taketh approach. Um, and going back originally to Erwin, to your point, 
Roberts doesn't even acknowledge diversity as a compelling interest anymore. Rather, he talks about interests the universities view as compelling, which is a shift that is, uh, that is actually not reflected in the Fourth Circuit's majority yet, because uh, it, it came beforehand. But so in terms of what law schools should be doing, they should be thinking about the first statement Roberts made, which is trying to take opportunities to increase diversity through race neutral means. The hard part of interpreting it is his language about not using the same means, uh, not having a backdoor approach. But so, and I wanna pick on, up on what something Kevin said, Whatever you do, you should be aware right now of the record you're creating, the record your faculties are creating. The more you have, uh, do law school faculty members who uh, generally have a great understanding of the law sometimes speak in ways that does not reflect the current state of the law? Well, as a general counsel at a university, I could only speculate that that is possible. Um, you all are really the best understanders of the law in the world. but. Uh, what record are you creating? What are your faculty saying in emails? What are they saying in public? Because the Thomas Jefferson case, as you see in the dissent, they looked for text messages. They looked for anything uh, that could be used as evidence of discriminatory intent. And it's very difficult, particularly for your tenured faculty members, perhaps to hold back. Um, and so, but there are a number of tools. So the University of Michigan, um, we uh, we have our own uh, Ward Connerly impact through Prop 2. So we've been operating, so we won Grutter and then lost on the constitutional issue, the change. So we have a variety of programs, um, at least at the undergraduate level. I'll talk about pipeline programs. We've done things like a Go Blue Guarantee that uh, provides free tuition for anyone in the state below $60,000 in meat and family income. Um, we've done outreach. Um, and what we found, unfortunately, and this is the point we made in our amicus brief, that taking all of those efforts did not solve the problem of racial diversity on our campus. So we have put a ton of resources in. But in terms of what you can do, um, <laughs> there are partnerships. I mean, I have a long list, but I want to also uh, uh, cede the floor to others. But there are a variety of things you can do now, um, including in looking at programs with you know, minority serving institutions, what kind of partnerships you make. But the key question in terms of creating the record is, what can you say right now is the race neutral explanation for doing it? And how do you avoid having your faculty colleagues muddy the record? A great point. Kevin? Yeah. I, I... I think uh, Tim offered a lot of uh, sound advice. I, I do think it's um, hard for a law school dean or administrator to, um, 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 I don't want to say censor, but control in any way what faculty members say. But uh, I would say that um, one of the things we saw in California after Prop 209 uh, was a, a real fear of litigation, and some would say, over conservatism and what steps could be taken in ensuring a diverse student body. Uh, in fact, and I won't name the, 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 the president of the University of California's name who said this, uh, she said that if uh, we weren't getting sued for our efforts at outreach, uh, we weren't doing enough in terms of our admissions uh, pr procedures and process. Uh, and I think there may have been a, an overreaction in the state in fear of litigation. I don't want to be sued. I don't, I'm sure nobody wants to be sued. Uh, but I think that we should be careful in not overreacting to the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, I do think that the pathway programs uh, are, are something to think carefully about. And we have our own and a lot of schools do. Uh, I think that uh, having a discussion uh, of admissions criteria and procedures with the faculty is a very sound thing to do now. And we'll, we'll probably do that at UC Davis, even though we've been living a, under a Prop 209 regime. I do think it's important to point out the University of California, after Prop 209 was passed, saw some pretty dismal numbers in terms of uh, admissions and enrollment of people of color. Uh, but this past uh, admission cycle, 
the, um, the, the University of California uh, had an incredibly diverse and rich student body that was admitted. Uh, and it, it took a while, um, uh, but uh, I think that we are, are, are in many ways where we were in 1996. That's not saying much because I think there was a setback, but I think what it is saying is that efforts to um, um, diversify student bodies can bear fruit. And I guess I, I, I look at it slightly different than you, Erwin, in terms of, of, of using proxies for race. I, I would, in, and also in, in, as an alternative to uh, saying we want a diverse student body, uh, I would visualize a rationale uh, and one that I think the University of California considers um, important, that we should try to enroll a student body that, that reflects and is willing to serve the diverse communities of our state. We're a public university with a very diverse population, with a K through 12 population that's over 50% Latino. Uh, we, we, uh, we should strive to produce lawyers uh, that reflect that rich diversity and uh, have experience and are willing to represent that diversity. Um, so I, I think I think of it slightly different ways, um, uh, but maybe getting at the same point. Can I just, I, I was with Kevin uh, all the way until the end, which was when you were talking about having law school graduates who can ser serve diverse community members that seems like a, a, a you've threaded the needle, but then you also talked about reflecting the diversity of the community. And I would say that would come right up against the racial balancing point that the Supreme Court made absolutely clear in the Harvard and UNC case, and which the majority in the T Thomas Jefferson case also acknowledged. So I just think this is, again, where thinking about wording and being intentional about wording matters. And, and just one more follow-up, now is a good time. You've got, you're right upon the verge of admission season, is to look at your websites and your materials. What do they actually say? And maybe have someone do a cold review, one of your undergrads or something. Just go online in a way that the Pacific Legal Foundation might do to look, what do you actually say? And I will say also about the Thomas Jefferson case, the majority did cite that the school board enacted their view that they insisted it be race neutral. That, that is that they drew upon a specific statement affirming that obligation. So as you think about what you might say as a belt and suspenders thing, you might consider that, or at least talk of course to your general counsel early and often. Another set of questions go to scholarships, which again, some of you mentioned. To what extent can there be race-based scholarships, or do scholarships have to be administered in a way that's racially neutral? And I know that all of you being at UC or U Michigan schools have had to deal with scholarship questions. Do you have thoughts about that or advice to how schools might think about it going forward? Kevin, maybe start with you rather than have you always finish. Um, I, I guess I, I, that's a very thorny issue that I spent a fair amount of time consulting with campus council on. Uh, and uh, we do not have any scholarships like that. Um, we, we do have some that relate to, I believe, uh, 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 applicants who are in fairly recognized uh, Indian tribes, um, but we, we generally don't have race-based scholarships or allocate financial aid in that way. And just to clarify on that, and I, we're the same at Berkeley, the general counsel of the University of California has opined that being a member of a Native American tribe is a political affiliation, not a racial classification, so it doesn't run afoul of this. That's an issue that the Supreme Court left open this term in another case, Burkine versus Halland, and is certainly to come back to the court. Um, but like you, Berkeley doesn't administer any race-based scholarships because of our view that Prop 209, which were its preference based on race, would forbid that. Tim, as I come to you for this, two of the questions that come in for us, and I'll read them to you. What about a scholarship that is awarded only to students 
that attend an HBCU undergrad college? What about when there are disparate incomes, I'm sorry, disparate outcomes in the recipients of facially neutral scholarships, which really takes the first question we were talking about in terms of proxies and also that puts it in the scholarship context. So Erwin, part of this I'd say is how risk averse is your institution? Right now, I think the writing is on the wall that financial aid is, is no different than admissions. And, and just to clarify, we do not, like the California schools, we do not um, have race-based scholarships and financial aid. We do allow something called pool and match, if you're not familiar with that, where we are willing to take scholarships, uh, money from donors who want their dollars to support, for example, underrepresented minorities. But since it is not increasing or changing the overall pool of scholarship money, essentially we're allowing donors to say that their money is in fact supporting an African-American student, for example. Um, that there is OCR guidance uh, from years ago that blesses that approach. Um, in terms of minority serving institutions, I, uh, again, without providing legal risk, not every student who attends a minority serving institution is African American. And so it is how you go about stating from the onset why you are doing this. Um, the students who attend minority serving institutions will in many cases have overcome different challenges in life. Their experience going through that educational system may give them insights that would be relevant to your law school classes. You're all good lawyers. You need to come up with reasoned arguments as to why that intent is appropriate. And I think it's not that hard to come up with arguments in that space. Um, on whether it has disparate impact, I, I, yes, that's the Thomas Jefferson question. I, I What I think is there will be litigation trying to understand what the Chief Justice said. But I think rely, there's a lot of good reason to rely on the first part of what he said and not be afraid of the second part. And uh, so I'd also say we have a separate alumni association. And Erwin, you said it exactly right. The question for Rob that you posed as to private entities, what is the intermingling? Is, is essentially the outside entity doing the bidding of the institution? How do you share information about students? Is it through FOIA if you're a public? Um, those are the questions that you would wanna consider. A question that just came in related to this is related to race-based or scholarships run by outside agencies. Could have scholarships based on membership, e.g. were active in their undergraduate Black Student Association or future plan to be involved in BALSA? I don't know. The answer should be the same as a minority serving institution. But it should be the same. I guess the, the question is, will there be judges who see that as too transparent? And it shouldn't. The analytical consistency ought to matter. Um, but atmospherics do come up, if that makes any sense. I think so. I think it's also the more what is done looks like it's being done with the intent of circumventing the court's decision, the more courts are gonna look at it as scans. That's why I very much agree with Tim and others who have said how this is presented becomes so important. If it's presented with strong race neutral justifications, I think it's much more likely to be allowed. And I think it's very important not talk about it in terms of it being a attempt to circumvent the decision. Do others have thoughts in response to that question? I agree with that, and I would say that uh, membership in these organizations or, you know, uh, attending a H H S H S C B U uh, would indicate uh, a, a, um, a possible experience uh, with a, a diverse student body and maybe a possible ability to represent and serve that student body. Uh, and I, I think it's it's uh, um, it's not that different than uh, saying that uh, I, I want to um, um, go to law school to represent migrants from Central America, 
uh, because I've spent the last few years working in organizations uh, representing them. Not everybody who works for a, 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 one of those organizations is a person of color, but they do have an interest in serving that community. And of this Tim. Sorry, I just, I noticed the question from Brian Hinkle in the comments. I would say that if you haven't already received OCR complaints or letters, um, you should be aware that there is sort of a cottage industry of people who will go through every one of your listed scholarships and look for words that suggest they are race or gender based exclusively. And you will your institution, if you haven't already, should expect to get OCR investigated type complaints asking about these scholarships. Spoiler alert, we have them too. All of you have them. So it does raise questions about how you comply with that, um, whether you change the title, whether that's consistent with the donative intent and the underlying gift agreement. Um, whether you change criteria, for example, that says it is not your membership in the group, but say, for example, your commitment to expanding opportunities for people in that group that then has it pass muster. But it's a great question and uh, something, again, to be looking out as you look at all of your records. Another set of questions that have come concerns pipeline programs. And let me read some of the questions that have come. Um, one of the questions says, if a pipeline program is race-based for BIPOC students, for example, but as a private nonprofit or private organization that does not take federal funds, are those programs still okay? Another, which also went to our question about private entities and administering scholarship programs. Another question came in, quote, what about a pipeline program that is two ways to be qualified based on ethnic diversity, race, or two based on lower socioeconomic status, had a Pell Grant an undergraduate? Because if both race and race neutral, would that be okay? And just to use these questions, the jumping off point of, are there limits on the kind of pipeline programs that law schools can create? And what advice or thoughts do you have as how law schools should go forward in regarding pipeline programs? Kevin, maybe you can start with you because you talked about the kind of pipeline programs that you've been working with. Well, I've only been working with race neutral pipeline programs and I'd be leery of um, not um, working with race neutral pipeline programs. Uh, and I, I think that, um, um, you know, we focused on first generation students on disadvantages overcome uh, and that type of thing. Um, and and just, just to be clear in, in thinking about it, it's, it's important to us, uh, and, and I think important to the court, really, that there be holistic review of files without race being considered in the admissions decisions. Um, and um, um, we thought carefully about, we have a, you know, a, a, what's called the King Hall Outreach Program. It's race neutral, focuses on disadvantage uh, and first generation status. Uh, has uh, had a, 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 um, um, a wide range of students from white students to, to non-white students uh, and uh, has contributed to, to some of our classes uh, uh, at the law school. But I, I and maybe I, I cautioned against being uh, conservative, too conservative before overreacting to Supreme Court's decision, but I am um, um, I, leery of race specific pipeline programs for, for, for us in California anyway. Erwin, the second option you gave, uh, second hypo had a number of different pieces to it. Uh, I think it, uh, the more you have as possibilities where race is one of five categories, you are reducing but not eliminating litigation risk. And the law firms are now building pipeline programs. Could you over time argue, for example, that uh, we see historically that students who go through these pipeline programs at, at law firms really are the ones who do best when they come to our law schools? Can you identify a factual empirical basis to say 
this private entity has chosen on the basis of race, which we can't do, but for this entirely different reason, we see that these students really excel, the kind of mentoring they get, the LSAT prep. That's what I'd be thinking of. And I think the consensus of all of us is the more they're set up in a race neutral way, the more likely they are to be upheld, the more race is a factor in who gets to participate, the more it's going to be subject to challenge. If I could just mention Please. one last thing, the law school admissions council has been very supportive of these programs for a number of years, providing financial assistance. And so uh, there's been some resources out there. I'm not sh sure what's out there right now, but there's certainly support for these kinds of programs. We haven't talked about essays, of course, and that is a pathway. I don't know how you all solve the problem of generative AI, but you can, an African-American student who's been stopped eight times by the police has a very compelling story as to why that experience is important. And analyzing that particular student's experience is right within the four corners of what the chief is saying, I think. I think that's right. And we have many students who apply to our school who, who, who themselves or their family have had experience with the, the immigration enforcement authorities in the country and want to come to law school so they can address the issues that they saw through that process, including having family members deported uh, and, and the like. And I, I don't see that as any way being affected um, by the Supreme Court's decision in, in, in thinking about the individual case in a holistic review of the entire file. Another set of questions come about targeted outreach. One of the points I made in the first session was, if you think about the admissions process, there's getting people to apply, there's admissions decisions, and then there's yield. The Supreme Court's decision was focused on the middle in terms of the use of race and admissions. It doesn't deal with outreach and recruitment and doesn't deal with yield. Are there implications, though, of the Supreme Court's decision in terms of what schools can do in outreach or in recruitment at the yield stage? There is a California Supreme Court case interpreting Proposition 209, the high voltage versus city of San Jose, that does find targeted outreach to be prohibited by Prop 209, though what it means to have targeted outreach is certainly unclear after the decision. Your thoughts about how schools should go about approaching outreach, recruitment, in light of the decision? Are there implications of the decision for it? Tim, if I could start with you. Sure. There's a logical piece to this that that could be next on the chopping block, but I think in terms of what motivates plaintiffs, it's the admissions decisions and the financial aid decisions. I think targeting, frankly, in terms of litigation risk is pretty low on the spectrum. And so if you wanna make choices, again, all of this is a matter of your appetite for risk, but I think targeted efforts to bring students to campus um, is the least risky. I, I, with these kind of situations, going back to the list of factors, if you also had programs say to fly low SES students or students, first gen students or students who have experienced foster care, in addition to having efforts targeted in, in bringing underrepresented minorities to campus. I think that helps. But again, just, I think it's less of an interesting target. I know much to add. Um, I, I think good points have been made. It, it, I, I do think, as Tim says, it's not a likely litigation target, although it was a litigation target in California, uh, and we did a, get a decision from the California Supreme Court, but there hasn't been much follow-up concern with that, I don't think. Um, and I, I, I do think that the, the wider you spread your net in terms of outreach, um, the better in all kinds of, of ways, litigation and otherwise. Um, at, at the same time, um, you, you, you if you're the University of California, you, you don't have trouble getting applicants from Beverly Hills, while you do have trouble getting applicants from East LA and South Central LA. Um, and so, and, and if you're interested in, in um, maximizing your applicant pool, 
uh, you'd probably focus less on Beverly Hills and, and more on South Central and East LA in terms of uh, getting 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 applicants. Uh, any other things on this topic? There was a question that came that says, if schools see a significant decline in minority students' enrollment and then significantly alter their admissions process, how do you anticipate such change would be interpreted by courts with regard to intent to evade the students' fair admission limitations? And again, we're not getting legal advice, but are there thoughts you have about how schools should approach this knowing that all of us are at schools that had to deal with that reality of a substantial decrease in enrollment of minority students after the initiatives in our state. Happy to take a first cut at it. This is one where, again, the Fourth Circuit's Thomas Jefferson opinion is instructive, where uh, they specifically tackle the question of what is the baseline, that the Constitution does not enshrine at any point the absence of any change. Um, and so uh, there may well be changes, and that could be all for the good. So it goes really back to this point about what you state as the reason for the underlying policy that makes or affects such change. I, I think uh, we should all expect, um, given the attention paid to the Supreme Court's decision uh, and the fact it's been in the news for weeks, um, that uh, the decision may affect uh, the application rates of people of color to colleges and universities and law schools. Uh, it did in California after Prop 209. Uh, and as some advocates of affirmative action have emphasized, uh, the Supreme Court's decision, and I'm not saying this is right, but this is one point of view, uh, shows that people of color aren't wanted by colleges, and universities, which I disagree with, but some people say that. Uh, we can expect decline, I, I fear. Uh, and then the question is how we as universities and law schools respond to it. Um, uh, we could do nothing uh, and say we're being race neutral and doing nothing. Uh, or we could say, what can we do legally to increase the applic applicants uh, from uh, underrepresented groups? Um, not to prefer them in the process, but to uh, re-add them back to the process that they, they've absconded from. I don't want to put the blame on them, but I think that we, we have to expect what we saw in California uh, is there's going to be numbers are going to go down uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to respond and the choices are nothing or do something. Uh, and I think we should do something lawfully, of course. Uh, but we have to think about what we need to do. And I do think, I agree with Tim, careful university council, uh, it, it really rests on how we explain it and say it and justify it. One of the questions that came goes back to an earlier part of our discussion. It says, can Tim elaborate and follow up scholarship of pool and match for diversity scholarships? Sorry, that's the secret sauce at Michigan. I shouldn't have spilled the beans. <laughs> so, it's not. Uh, pool and match is something, you should talk to your general counsels about this. I, I don't want to get into legal advice. And I, I will say uh, there is Department of Education guidelines uh, or guidance on pool and match. Um, and really what it is, it's, it's premised on the notion that the available pool of financial dollars is not changing. It's just, are you willing to let a donor know that their dollars went to a particular student? A question came, and it relates to a question we got in the first session this morning. It says, given that Grutter was not overturned, why not say that law school affirmative action was upheld, and so it may fall within the special considerations like the military academies in footnote four? Isn't the failure to overturn Grutter helpful to that reading of footnote four in students for fair admission? Um, I have pined on this in the first session, um, but really interested in what your conclusions are about it. I didn't hear what you said, Erwin, but I agree with you. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, Tim, I think you're on mute. I think you'd want to be worried about Rule 11 sanctions there that, to, with that argument. Sorry. You know, what, what I had said earlier was Baki was about medical schools. Gruder was about law schools. Fisher was about undergraduate admissions. I read the Supreme Court's decision from 10 days ago as overruling those decisions, even though Chief Justice Roberts never explicitly says that. Certainly when you read, say, Justice Thomas's concurrence or Justice Sotomayor and Justice Jackson's dissent, they read the majority opinion as overruling Grutter. To the extent that Grutter was explicit about diversity as a compelling interest, this decision rejects diversity as a compelling interest. To the extent that Grutter said that there should be deference to college and university administrators this case expressly rejects such deference. So it's hard for me to make the argument, as much as I wish it were, that Grutter wasn't overturned by this. But certainly there's the argument and there is the exception. I mean, footnote four says it's not dealing with military academies. And that does raise interesting questions of how will the court draw those distinctions? I think the footnote, by the way, makes it even clearer for law schools by calling out one particular type of institution. It's a great point. One of the other questions that came is many law schools routinely report racial breakdowns of admitted students, both in more limited settings, faculty meetings, alumni, or in public settings like websites. It seems like this practice could be used against law schools now, uses evidence that race neutral means or simply a pretext to achieve racial diverse classes using illegal means. Should schools be cautious now in reporting racial breakdown of the admitted students? And it goes to another question that we got that goes to ABA standard 206 and the reporting requirements that law schools have to do with regard to the ABA. Your thoughts on reporting and how the ABA standards relate to this? Kevin, you've been a dean for a long time. Well, I, I think that um, um, we share generally information on our website that we report to the ABA uh, and they require, um, at least in certain circumstances, um, demographic data about our student body. Uh, and we tend to share uh, that information with uh, our law school and actually alumni community and others, um, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, I think that it'd be hard to say that we were um, using racial preferences or considering race in some way when we're sharing information that we share with our accreditors that's required by our accreditors, and that if we don't share with our accreditors, we could get unaccredited. Uh, I, I, I do think um, um, it's, it's not a, uh, um, a legal violation uh, to take pride uh, in, 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 in having a, a rich student body, uh, and um, uh, I don't see how this decision could affect uh, that kind of reporting. One of the things, though, that the UC law schools, at least, have been in a discussion with the ABA about is when reporting would perhaps reveal the identity of particular students. So this isn't about the overall reporting and the aggregate numbers that we're all saying the ABA requires and that we do, but sometimes the ABA is requiring and now proposing increasing the requirements at a very specific level. And if there's very few students in that cohort, it might be possible then for people to identify. So imagine that they want report of bar pass rate by race, and there's only a few students in the category of race. So people would then be able to identify who that is. Or now when they're talking about wanting reports with regard to sexual orientation and disability, if there's only a few students in that cohort, giving the number could identify who the people are. And I have real concerns about it in that context, not the kind of reporting that we're talking about now in terms of aggregate number of students. And Kevin, you and I have been part of the discussion along with the other UC law deans. Yep. I, I would think you'd want to be thinking about FERPA in those instances. Yep. And anything we prepare as a document is subject to 
in, in California called a public records act request. And then Michigan and other public universities, there's similar kinds of requirements of turning over documents once they're produced. Some of the other questions that we've got, can you elaborate further regarding any potential insights is why the efforts and resources schools support in improving racial diversity have not worked or yield desired results. From the experiences that you've had, are there things that haven't been successful in achieving diversity? So socioeconomic status in Michigan, um, we have been, it's been wonderful. We have increased the number of low SES students um, but looking at the population of Michigan, um, that doesn't do the trick demographically because there are many more people who are not underrepresented who are low income in the state. Um, and so Kallenberg's point does not hold true, at least in the state of Michigan. I do think some people thought that adding the GRE is a possible test uh, to, to um, 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 be an alternative to the LSAT. Some people thought that would add diversity. I don't think that has done much. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't have, take an opinion here about whether eliminating the LSAT would, would have much of an impact on diversity. I know it's a complicated issue, um, but, but I do think that, um, you know, that, that, you know, fiddling with the test taking um, um, uh, hasn't had much of an impact on, on admissions. Uh, I do think that the pathway programs, I'm, I'm just talking about ours, um, haven't had a, as big an impact as maybe some would like, uh, and uh, they're resource intensive and, and um, you know, take, take uh, you know, uh, don't, don't always produce what, you, what you'd hope to be produced. So I, I think that we're doing our best under the circumstances and the rules that are imposed, um, but it's not the easiest. And uh, I do think that the limits on directing financial aid, um, um, and, and we abide by those like we should, um, um, th there's don't take into account that privates and other schools you know, you know, don't, you know, don't seem to follow those same rules. Uh, and it's a competition for a small number of students of color in some instances. Another question that relates to what you're talking about concerning da data from a moment ago. I'd like to hear your opinions on the gathering and reporting of racial and ethnic data. What are your thoughts on running aggregate data during the admission cycle and looking at how the overall pool and admitted pool are developing? So this isn't about what we were talking about a moment ago, the data on the ultimate class. It's saying, is there any problem with schools keeping track as they go along with regard to racial and ethnic data? for fear that then it would be said that they were making subsequent decisions in an inappropriate way. Well, that's, of, oh, yeah, Tim, that's, please. Yeah, thanks. That's exactly what the majority opinion looked at is one of the factors in Harvard that they pointed to that as, see, this was an effort all along to get to a racially balanced class. And so collecting it and then relying on that information. So in terms of the factual record you might be creating and doing so, you should think carefully about how it, is it is it worth it? Any thoughts on that, Kevin? No, I don't have much to add. I, I do think we generally tell admissions professionals that they should rely, you know, keep track of the admissions process and the numbers coming in, uh, what the yield is, um, what the how the finance financial aid budget is doing under the circumstances, uh, and um, you know. I never thought about masking the demographic information in the information that's looked at by the admissions professionals, um, whether it's gender or race or um, or, or anything really. Um, I yield in, in in things like that. I, I do think um, it, we should be thinking carefully about that, and I I think that's probably a good good thing to do. Please, Tim. Yeah, I just, following up on what Kevin said and what Bob said, um, Rob said, the 
you ought to be thinking now about what kind of written training materials you have for your admissions staff. Would you elaborate a little bit? Sure. Uh, explaining the opinion, the intent, what your expectations are, maybe giving some hypotheticals would be a helpful document to be able to point to later on. It's in the same way in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act world. Being able to point to training efforts is a very useful defense. Um, and so it's good to do for the right reasons um, because it's now the law and you all wanna follow the law. It's also good perhaps as a litigation risk management uh, mitigation strategy. One thing that we have, oh, please go ahead. I was just gonna, Joke, we should have had all our admissions professionals um, uh, tune in today. And hopefully many are. Um, I, we have focused for the program on admissions because that's what students of your admission versus Harvard College and the North Carolina case are about. What are your thoughts about implications of the Supreme Court's decision with regard to faculty and staff recruitment and hiring? Tim, since you're nodding, I'll start with you. Uh, I made a mistake there. So uh, schools and colleges already are prohibiting prohibited from using race as a decision-making factor in their employment decisions. Um, so uh, I, I think this will be, uh, uh, that's, I'll, I'll just stop there. In the, as Tim says, in the states that have initiatives that prohibit affirmative action, we already cannot give preference on the basis of race. Private schools, though, have operated differently until now, and public schools in places not covered by such initiatives have. And related to this, many schools now ask applicants for faculty positions to submit diversity statements. And the UC Santa Cruz case is one of the first challenging that, it's being challenged on First Amendment grounds. Kevin, any thoughts with regard to? I, 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 I don't have much to add. I, I do think that some uh, uh, commentators view the diversity statements required by the University of California uh, as, a, as a way to consider race. Um, in the hiring process. I, I don't think that's the case. And I think the university's explanation makes perfect sense to me. We want people uh, who are going to be able to teach and enrich a diverse group of students in, in the University of California. Um, but I do think that it's one of those targets that might be used um, by adherence to um, the Supreme Court's latest affirmative action decision. We are just about out of our time. Could I ask each of you for any concluding thoughts about the decision, about paths forward, about unanswered questions? Um, maybe go in reverse order of where we started. Start with you, Kevin, and then Rob, and then Tim. I, I just want to reiterate that I think this decision requires careful consideration, a review, a discussion, uh, and that, um, you know, it may disappoint some people, um, but it should make us um, reconsider and think about how we can do our very best uh, for, for the university, the law school, and the students. Thank you. So thank you so much, Erwin, for including me and uh, my co-panelists. Um, I guess two things, not surprisingly, consult your lawyers. Uh, tip your waiters and consult your lawyers. But I, here's what I would say. Uh, the Supreme Court made it harder. It didn't make it impossible. So that means we all have to work harder. And that is just one of the challenges in life. We, the students we are looking to admit have gone through far worse challenges than we will ever do in trying to include diverse students in our student body. So uh, redouble your efforts. And if you care about doing it, do it. You're each terrific. Thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to be part of the discussion. Thank and you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I don't know if Mark is able to come back. I will just finish up. I know it's been a number of hours on Zoom. Um, I'll conclude, as Tim just did, 
by saying that the Supreme Court has made it harder but not impossible to achieve diversity. I would draw from this morning's discussion, I know it's going to the afternoon in most of the country, several things. First, that schools can continue to pursue diversity as an objective, though how they do it is limited now. That it's important to learn from the schools that are deal without affirmative action for a number of years. As I mentioned, the public schools in California, Arizona, Michigan, Washington State have had to achieve diversity without being able to give a preference based on race. I hope that everyone who's listening will reach out to those at those schools, and there'll be more effort by those in these states to disseminate their message. That there are still many paths that are open to achieve diversity. There's a great deal of uncertainty, as we just talked about in the last panel, about what can and can't be done going forward, but it's important to explore these paths and to see what are the ones that are still going to be able to be used. And I very much agree with all in the last panel are saying how we end up talking about this and how we justify what we're doing is going to matter a great deal. The more it looks like a school is trying to circumvent the Supreme Court decision, the more it's going to be vulnerable. The more it can justify what it's doing in race neutral terms, the more likely it is to be upheld. I'll just conclude today's program by thanking those at SS, Judy Irene, Tracy Thomas, and all who put this program together. Thank my co-chair, Mark Alexander, for all his work on it. Tremendously thank all of the panelists. Um, what terrific discussion we had, thanks to them. And I thank to all of you for tuning in. As many have said, this is just an early part of a conversation that's gonna go on for months and years. And it's so important that the law schools work together as ways to achieve diversity even in light of the Supreme Court's decision. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in today.